I want to welcome you to week three of our series called The Kingdom, where we're looking at uh, six parables of, of Jesus and, uh, and what they mean for us today. And I'm not checking a text. I actually want to read you something that somebody texted me, so I guess I am kind of checking a text. But this was after, um, after week one of our series, uh, a really good friend of mine, Harry, who uh, attends online, uh, texted me after we, we looked at the, the parable of the sower. And uh, what he said, I thought was worth reading. He said, bro, which is how I like my text messages to start. <laughs> he said, bro, this series is going to be like putting a mirror in front of every chair and saying, okay, here you are, deal with that so we can move forward. And I don't think you can capture the essence of the parables of Jesus any better than that. The, the, the parables that Jesus gave uh, which I think it's just a, it's an amazing thing to be talking about words that Jesus himself uttered 2,000 years ago. But as we, as we go through this series, one of the most important things to remember about it is that the parables of Jesus are not to be approached like windows that we look through in order to see everybody else. The parables of Jesus are meant to be approached primarily as a mirror we look into in order to face ourselves which, you know, I'm, I'm still a pretty young guy by most people's standards, but the older I've gotten, the more certain I've become that facing ourselves is absolutely the hardest thing we're ever going to have to do. I really believe that. But if we allow the parables of Jesus to cause us to face ourselves, uh, then they'll change us in all the ways that not only God, but, but even I believe we ourselves want to be changed. And so today we're going to look at what is probably, uh, probably Jesus' most famous parable, I say that because it's, it's a parable that 2,000 years after it was first uttered it has laws named after it even in our culture. So today we're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, I want to read that to you. It's, it's found in Luke chapter 10. Uh, on the front end of our time together, we'll read verses 30 through 37. It says, Jesus took up the question... And said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. And Jesus told him, go and do the same. This is God's word. Uh, one of the things that's unique about this parable, of, uh, at least of the ones that we're looking at, is this is the only parable that Jesus gave as an answer to a question. That's why in verse 30 on the front end, it says, Jesus took up the question and said, and then he gives the parable. And so to really understand this parable, I want to look not just at the parable itself, but at the exchange between Jesus and a law expert uh, that leads up to it because their exchange tells us something that I consider to be really profound about ourselves. And what it says about us is going to serve as our first and kind of main idea during our time together. Here it is. Number one, uh, the essence of what it means to be human is to love. Now, here, here's where I, I get that idea. In, in verses 25 through 28, it says, Just then, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus asked him. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. So first off, when the lawyer asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, what, this is a man who was an expert in the law. He knew more about the Old Testament than we'll probably ever understand in our lifetime. What he was really asking Jesus was essentially, Jesus, what does it mean to live a life congruent with God's design for humanity? 
Uh, he, he's asking the question, basically, um, what did God build me for, and what does it mean to be what I was designed to be and to do what I was designed to do as a human? And the answer, as confirmed by the Son of God himself in this passage, is, is love. This is Jesus saying that the essence of what it means to be a human and to live a human life the way that the designer of human life uh, intended for it to be lived is it's all fundamentally about love. And, and this, is idea, this idea is something that makes sense when you survey the whole of Scripture um, because, for instance, 1 John reminds us that God himself is love. In the creation account, uh, in, in the book of Genesis, reminds us that we're designed in God's image. If you fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry, just before he goes to the cross, he completes the old covenant and establishes a new covenant. And with that new covenant, Jesus gave us one command that he said would be the singularly qualifying marker that we legitimately do belong to him as his disciples. And it was all about the love that we have for people. And if you've ever been to a wedding, I'm sure you've probably heard somebody read the famous last verse of 1 Corinthians 13 that tells us that faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is love. And so this exchange between Jesus and this lawyer, uh, first off, is, is confirming something that I think the rest of the Bible is pretty plain about. It's that the essence of what it means to be a human is, is to love. It's an integral part of our design without which we simply cannot be or do what God has designed us to be or do. And this is something that I think regardless of your, your background or even your, your, your belief system today, I think this is something that the human heart just intuitively senses. Uh, the, the plain fact of the matter is that really whether we like it or not, love dominates the human life. And all you really have to do to see evidence of that in our culture is listen to the most popular songs or read the most popular books or watch the most popular movies and you're gonna find over and over again that they tend to revolve around this thing called love. You know, the, the, the absence of love uh, usually takes away a person's will to live and the presence of love and the hope of love and the certainty of love is, is something that in a unique way tends to make life worth living. And, and I, I would even venture to say that if you looked back in your own life, you would, you would have to admit that it's, it's been the times in which you have, uh, have experienced what it is to give and receive love, that it's in those times that you have felt most human, you felt most alive. And, and so again, uh, what Jesus is confirming for this lawyer is something that I think we all have at least some kind of awareness of. It's that the essence of what it means to be human and, and the thing that we were built for, the thing that God requires of us, what it means to live the human life, the way that it's meant to be lived is all about this thing called love, both love for God and love for neighbor. And so before we move forward, I just want to briefly look at, at what these two principles mean. All right, first off, loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind basically means that nothing comes before God. It means that nothing absorbs you more than God, nothing delights you more than God. It's about loving God with 100% of your, your thoughts 100% of the time. And that's a really steep ask I'll give you, but I think that this is a, a remarkably fair ask when you consider the Christian worldview. Because the question is, where did your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind come from? It, that's a question that we all need to answer for ourselves. And I think when you really boil it down, it really comes down to just one of two answers. Either uh, it's an accident or God gave it to you. Amen. Those are really the two answers that we eventually have to arrive at. Uh, secularism which is kind of a pervasive worldview in our culture, secularism would basically tell you uh, that everything about you is an accident, that you came from insignificance, you were headed toward insignificance, and at bottom, you're basically a grown-up germ that evolved from slime, and you owe nothing to anyone. Christianity, of course, offers you a wildly different perspective about you. Christianity actually says that not a single thing about you is an accident, that everything about you you, you, you at bottom, at your core, are a personal creation of a personal creator God who has given you everything that you have. And so it just stands to reason, if you follow the logic of the worldview, that if you are not an accident, but God actually did create you and he did give you everything you have, then loving him simply means 
uh, just giving him only what he's already given you, which happens to be absolutely everything that you have. So that's the first principle. And the second one uh, that, that sort of flows really naturally from that, uh, according to this passage, is about loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, which again, I think is, is at least according to, to the Christian worldview, uh, even if you don't agree with it, I think it's very difficult to argue with the logic of it. Because if, as Christianity teaches, you are an image bearer of the God who has given you everything, and every single human being that you'll ever come across is equally an image bearer of that same God who gave you everything, then it stands to reason that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And what it means to love your neighbor as yourself is basically that you'll live to meet the needs of the person next to you with all the vigor that you live to meet your own needs. It means that you will invest uh, the same amount of time and thought and energy into meeting their needs as you would your own. It also means that you will celebrate uh, exactly as much when somebody else gets the thing that you desired for yourself, uh, you'll celebrate exactly the way that you would if you yourself get it. And, and so that basically at bottom is what these two commands that uh, according to Jesus, God built us for are all about. And so Jesus tells this lawyer, just do that. Just love God the way he deserves to be loved and love your neighbor as yourself and according to Jesus, you'll live. And so then in verse 29, we read, but wanting to justify himself, this law expert asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <clears throat> The thing I find interesting about this question is that we're explicitly told the motive, what the motive behind it was. This, this law expert wanted to, wanted to justify himself. And so basically, in response to hearing the requirements of God, this lawyer turns to Jesus and he says, okay, Jesus, could you be a little bit more specific? Because those are, albeit, those are kind of intangible commands. And so the lawyer is hoping that Jesus is gonna bring those commands down to his level uh, sort of put handles on it so that he can go do what God expects of him and, and, and sort of master that so that he can save himself. And then in response to this man's question, or, or maybe it's more appropriate to say in response to the motivation behind this man's question, Jesus gives us arguably his most famous parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm teeing this up this way for, for a reason. I say all this to say, what this parable does primarily is it answers the question, what exactly does the love that God require of us look like? And the answer to that is gonna be our next idea during our time together. Here it is. Number two, the love that God requires is selfless. So let's read this parable again. It's verses uh, 30 through 35. It says, Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put, on, put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. And we'll just clip it there. So, so like I said on, on the front end here, this parable at least primarily answers the question, what does this love that God requires of us actually look like? And so what I want to do is just walk through some of the details of this story. Some of this maybe is obvious to you if you're super familiar with it. Some of it maybe you'll get phrased in a different way. But let's just walk through this. On the front end of this story, what you have is a man, presumably a Jewish man, who's been robbed, stripped, beaten, and left for dead on the side of the road. Uh, and, and so immediately, a priest and a Levite... Uh, both religious workers, both people that you would expect to stop and help this man pass by on the other side. The first thing to understand about this parable is why they didn't stop. And there's probably a number of reasons, but the main one is because everybody knew what, abandoned, what happened to you on abandoned desert roads in Jesus' day. 
They were tremendously dangerous places to stop, and so they knew that even stopping to help this man invited the same fate on themselves as they see on their, you know, their countrymen laying in the ditch, and so they pass by. But then uh, a Samaritan comes, and he stops to help. And so first and foremost, the original hearers of this parable would have understood that this Samaritan has already risked his life simply by stopping to check on this man. The the second thing that we see in this parable is how comprehensive the care is that the the Samaritan decided to offer him in stopping. Uh, Jesus said that he, uh, he bandages the man's wounds, he pours on olive oil and wine, and he puts the man on his own animal. And if you think about the scene that Jesus is describing here, you realize that all of this would have been very labor intensive for the Samaritan because Jesus said that this man was half dead on the side of the road, meaning he can't help himself. And so bandaging him, treating his wounds, and finding a way to get him on your animal, your mode of transportation, uh, you would have broke, broken a sweat doing that. Uh, on, on top of all of that, we're told that the Samaritan takes this man to an inn. That was obviously out of his way. So, so basically, this, this Samaritan has completely destroyed his own schedule and his own agenda and whatever he had going on in his life for the sake of this man that he's never met before. And then getting to the end, Jesus said uh, that he puts the man up on his own dime. And commentators will tell you that the two coins that the Samaritan offered for the man represented two months' rent. And then on top of that, lets the innkeeper know, whatever additional cost is incurred by this man's stay, you just let me know, and I'll pay for all of that out of pocket. Now, as I was studying this parable this week, the first thought that I had is that Jesus is trying to get us to see that, that the love God requires of us is a costly love. And while that's part of it, I think it's actually a lot deeper than that. Because no matter who stopped for this man, if if it was the priest, if it was the Levite, uh, whoever stopped to help this man would would have been, it would have been very costly for them to do so. But the most extraordinary aspect of this story And and, and the part of it that was really designed to grab the attention of the hearer in Jesus' day was not necessarily the kind of love given so much as the person giving the love, because the hero of the story, as it's famously named, is a Samaritan. Now, we know from history, actually, let, let me say this. A lot of times when you hear this parable being taught, what you'll hear is that Jews and Samaritans hated each other, and that's what makes this parable so grabby. But I actually don't think that's the most helpful way to understand it. Because I think what's what's more appropriate to say simply than Jews and Samaritans hated each other is is really just that Jews really hated Samaritans. See, the, the way that the Samaritan race came to be in the first place dates all the way back to the Old Testament, when the nation of Assyria uh, attacked Israel, sacked 10 of their 12 tribes, And in order to force those captured tribes of Israel to assimilate in their nation, they essentially raped the women. That was a common practice for conquering nations back in that day and age. It was incredibly cruel, but it was highly effective because it literally forced that nationality to come to an end and broke for generations to come the national ties that the descendants of that practice would have with their conquered nation. It forced that group of people biologically to assimilate into the culture of their captors. The point is, the race of people that came to exist as a result of that practice came to be known as the Samaritans. And Jews hated Samaritans, not for anything that they did, but simply because of who they were. And it is, it is crystal clear when you survey the gospel accounts that Jewish people viewed Samaritans as a subhuman species. They would walk around Samaria so as to avoid having to breathe the same air as a Samaritan person. And, and actually, in, in John's gospel, you see this, one of the most offensive terms that a Jewish person could call another person in Jesus' day was a Samaritan. So it was literally a, 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 a term that was synonymous with profanity. Now, I say all that to say, now that we can kind of see this parable the way the original hearers would have understood it, what Jesus is telling the story about here is a Samaritan who risked his life, broke his back, destroyed his schedule, and emptied his wallet, not even necessarily for somebody that he hated so much as for somebody that hated him. And that, Jesus tells us, is what the love that God requires of us looks like. 
It is an otherworldly, illogically selfless kind of love. It is a love given not just to people who can't pay you back, but it's a love given to people who have given you good reason not to extend it to them in the first place. Now, I, I just have to pause here and, and, and say this. If you read the parable of the Good Samaritan and, and you're inspired by it, you and I are very different people. I don't find this parable uh, anything other than incredibly convicting. And, and if I, I certainly don't want to, you know, cause any trauma on Sunday morning or, or trigger anybody or anything like that. But let me just, let me just invite you to, to kind of get to the place that this parable is designed to get us to. Can I ask you for a moment to consider the, the person or the people in your life who have treated you like Jews treated Samaritans in Jesus' day? People who have ostracized you and belittled you and marginalized you and made you feel like there was something wrong with you and kept you on the outside, no matter how much you desire to be accepted and to be brought into the inner ring, whatever that is for you. People who have been the greatest source of your pain what this parable is at its core is a challenge to you to love them with a life-risking, back-breaking, time-consuming, wallet-emptying kind of love. And as far as I'm concerned, there's not a person alive with a shred of self-awareness that can entertain the idea that they possess this kind of love. And so the question that this raises for me that I think it should raise for any honest reader is how on earth can this love develop in me? Because I don't have what it takes to just produce that. And there's, there's at least two answers that I see in this passage. There's two lessons that this law expert needed to learn that we need to learn if this love is going to develop in us. They're both equally important. I would, actually, I would actually say that you will be a profoundly imbalanced person if they're not coupled together. And these are lessons that we need to learn, not just the day that we come to Jesus, but every day after that, as long as God has us here. And those two lessons are going to be our final two ideas during our time together. Here's, here's the first one. It's going to be your next idea. Here it is. We need to accept that we can't justify ourselves. If I, if I can state this a little bit differently, what I'm getting at here is that real love can't grow in you until you accept the fact that you can't produce it. In verse 29, we already looked at this, but in verse 29, we're told, but wanting to justify himself, this law expert asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The word justify is not something that you hear used too often in our culture, but I actually think it's a remarkably relatable thing when you look at, at the definition of the Greek word translated justify. I'm, I'm going to read you actually two definitions of it. This is what it means to justify someone. It means to show someone to be such as he wishes himself to be considered, or second to that, it's to declare someone to be as he ought to be. So, so read verse 29 a little bit differently now. What we're told here is that in response to hearing what God requires in his law, this, this lawyer instinctively wanted to justify himself. It, it, what, we're, what we're reading is, in response to hearing God's requirements to his life, this, this lawyer suddenly wanted to make himself what he ought to be. There's only one reason for that. It's because he knew he wasn't what he ought to be. When, when I think about the concept of justification, there's always one specific story or, or, or illustration that comes to my mind. Uh, it, was, it was something that I saw years ago in a TV show called The Selection on the History Channel. Really cool show. It, it followed the lives of um, I mean, athletic guys, but basically just a bunch of average guys that were led through a Navy SEAL training camp by actual Navy SEALs. It was a really eye-opening show for me because I have a tendency, I had a tendency to think of Navy SEAL training. You know, I, I think about the physicality of it. But on the first episode, the lead instructor, uh, he explained that it's a fallacy to think of SEAL training that way. It's not primarily a physical thing. It's a mental thing because he as he explained, our minds break a lot more quickly than our bodies do, which is exactly what the show went on to very conclusively demonstrate. Uh, throughout the show, just to give you an idea of how wild it was, the instructors would randomly kidnap the contestants without warning. And when I say kidnap, I mean they would put a bag over their head, 
handcuff them, throw them in a van, and drive them to an undisclosed facility. And then they would sit them in a chair and, and tear the bag off their head, and they would be sitting in an interrogation room across the, the uh, table from actual Navy SEALs. And, uh, and they would then proceed to deliberately attempt to mentally, emotionally, psychologically break this person. And they were good at what they did. And I remember there was, there was this one guy on the show uh, that I was really rooting for. And, uh, and they, they kidnapped him and they brought him into the interrogation room. And, uh, and, and you, you could tell they knew what they were doing because they were asking him why questions. And why questions have a unique way of just opening people up. Why are you on this show? Why would you put yourself through this? Why would you sign up for something like, what, you know, what's wrong with you that would lead you to volunteer for something as miserable as this? And they were going in on him. And I remember he, he said something that was so emotional for him that as soon as he heard himself say the words out loud, he started to weep, which is a clear indicator that evidently that mindset is something he'd carried around with him his whole life. This is just the first time that he'd really faced it. And the, the exact phrase, I, I can't forget this, the exact phrase that he said that caused him to weep when he said it, he said, I have not been a good man. Most people would look at that guy and say, you know, that's an emotionally weak person. The Bible looks at that guy and says, no, that's an honest person. Because scripture teaches that the human heart, regardless of how you and I wanna compensate for this reality, and we all compensate in different ways, scripture teaches that the human heart has a deep, nagging awareness that it cannot hold up under scrutiny. And what I mean by that is very simply, one of the things you and I have in common is that we know there's something wrong with us. And we've known it since Genesis chapter 3, when we instinctively knew to hide from God and try to cover our shame with fig leaves. And so we all do exactly what the lawyer in the story does. We try to make ourselves what we ought to be. But ironically, what this parable and the whole of Scripture teaches is that it's, it's that exact instinctive reflex to try to make ourselves what we ought to be that ironically will keep us from ever becoming what we ought to be. And so understanding that and letting go of this idea that we can make ourselves what we ought to be is actually the first step in developing the love that God requires of us, as told in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, you've probably heard that idea before. You gotta accept that you can't justify yourself. One thing I don't think we talk about a whole lot is why that is the case. And I, I, let me just give you uh, two kind of I think pretty exhaustive answers to that question. First off, as long as you and I try to go through life as a self-justifying person, then there is a kind of compassion and a kind of love that you can show, sure. But first and foremost, your acts of love and mercy and compassion are gonna be motivated, even those actions are gonna be motivated by a desire for you to feel better about yourself or look better in the eyes of other people, which is actually a profoundly self-centered motive and is the exact opposite of the selfless love that God requires of us. But second, second to that, and I think this parable shows this even more clearly, is that as long as, as, long as the idea that, that you either can or you have justified yourself, it, it, to the degree that that idea it, it dwells within you, to that same degree, you're going to find in you uh, this, this condescending, uh, arrogant, you know, older brother sort of spirit towards certain groups of people in certain situations where, where even if you never say the words out loud, your mindset toward them is going to be, listen, just, just, just get yourself together. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's what I had to do. You know, everybody's got problems, great. You gotta face your demons, you gotta climb your mountains. I got to where I am because of the decisions that I made and, and you're in this situation that you're in because of the decisions that you made and you just need to get yourself together. I, I'm, I'm saying that to say a person who has been justified by Jesus and, and moves out into life and into relationships out of an awareness of their justification in Jesus is not going to look at people with that, through that lens because a person who's been justified by Jesus moves through life with this understanding that the only difference between me and the person across the table from me is this thing called grace. And so there's a, there's a unique dynamic to the kind of love that emanates from a heart that has been justified by Christ. It has a unique power source to it. It's, it's, 
it, it draws its power from a source outside of itself, and therefore it has an unlimited capacity to be replenished, even if its love is not returned. It, it's got a unique dynamic to it. It's got a certain unconditionality to it. And anybody listening to me, anybody listening to me, who has experienced that moment in your life when you've gone from trying to justify yourself to realizing that you've been justified by Jesus knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not suggesting that, you, that any Christian perfectly lives out of that from the moment that they get saved onward. There's just something happens to you the moment that you realize, I can't do this, but Jesus has done it for me. See, to be forgiven, to be forgiven by Jesus means you're free to go. To be justified by Jesus means you're free to come home. And what the gospel promises is that that is exactly what happens to you the moment that you put your trust in Jesus. And if you know that Jesus has justified you, if you know that Jesus has made you what you ought to be in the eyes of the Father, not because of what's in your heart, but because of what's in his heart, it melts you, it changes you, it humbles you. And it's the very beginning of the growth of this supernatural kind of love that Jesus is talking about here in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the first thing that we need is to accept that we can't justify ourselves. But the second thing that we need according to this, this parable is going to be our last idea today. Lastly, we need to encounter a life-changing love. See, on, on the surface of this parable... It looks like the point of it is that we should love people, even and especially people who are radically different from us. And certainly, that's part of the meaning of this parable. But Jesus', Jesus intention was much deeper than that, because here's how I think about it. If the only point Jesus wanted to get across is that you should love people who are different than you, then Jesus could have easily made the Samaritan the one in the ditch, and the Jewish man, the hero of the story who runs along and helps them, but Jesus didn't do that. Instead, in this parable, Jesus intentionally made the Jewish person the one who is in need of aid, and the Samaritan the one who provided it. And like everything else that Jesus said and Jesus did, there's a very specific reason that he did it that way. And the reason is because Jesus wanted his audience to identify with the person in the ditch. Jesus wanted his audience. 2,000 years ago, when these words left the mouth of the Savior of the world, it was designed, this parable was designed for the hearer to, in processing this parable, think, what would it be like if I was on the side of the road, powerless to help myself? And what would it be like if I saw someone's silhouette appear on the horizon coming toward me, and the closer they got to me, the more I realized that this was a person that I have disrespected, and I have dishonored, and I have rejected, and I've mocked, and I've ridiculed, and I've hated. It was a person who had every right to pass me by and celebrate my own undoing, yet for reasons that defy all human logic, decided to stop and offered me a life-risking, back-breaking, time-consuming, resource-depleting love so that I could get a second chance at life. What would it be like? This is the primary question you and I are meant to ask in reading this parable. What would it be like if you were on the other side of that one-way, no-strings-attached, unconditional, life-changing kind of love? The, the problem, this is what I believe, the problem that, that most people have when they read the parable of the Good Samaritan is reading it and walking away with a mindset that says, okay, I'm supposed to be the Good Samaritan, so let me go try to do that. When of course we're supposed to be the Good Samaritan, but the point is you and I can never even begin to become the Good Samaritan until we first realize we're the person in the ditch. You and I are not the heroes of the story. We're the ones who really need help. And what's noteworthy about this parable is at the very end of it, even hearing a story about this kind of love evidently had some kind of impact on the lawyer because at the end of it, Jesus asked this man, who was the hero of the story? Who's the one that lived in a way that honors God? And, and probably to his own surprise, this law expert that had seen Samaritans through a lens his entire life 
found himself saying it was the one who showed compassion. It was the one I've hated my entire life. It was the one I believe was despised by God simply for existing. It was the Samaritan. And here's the point. Here's the point. If simply hearing a story about this kind of love, this unconditional, selfless, one-way, no-strings-attached kind of love, if just hearing a story about that impacted this lawyer, then we should be impacted in a far greater way. Because the cross shows us in an infinitely greater way the love that this parable speaks whispers of. The cross shows us the demonstrated love of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, we're almost done, but I, I, have, uh, I have one story that I wanted to share with you before we close. Um, I, I couldn't help thinking about it. I've never shared this with you all before, but I couldn't help thinking about it while I was putting this together. Um, some of you may know I got my degree from uh, Moody Bible Institute online. And uh, I started that when I was in the fire department. I completed that while I was pastoring here. And um, I, I look back really fondly on my education. Uh, but there is, there's one specific class that stood out to me above all the rest because of one specific assignment we were given uh, in that class. The, the class was called The Church and the Community. And it was all about exploring what a lo local church's relationship should be with the community that God's placed it in. And I think it was week three of that class, uh, our professor gave us what I consider to be the hands down, the coolest assignment I have ever been given, not just in college, but in all of my education. And I still remember exactly what the requirements of the assignment was. This is all it said. Help somebody who is very poor and write about it. And, uh, and so I got the family together. Uh, I think at the time, it was just my son Everett and my daughter Scarlett that, that were born. I got, um, I got them and, and Katie in, uh, together, and, and I stopped at an ATM. I got some money out, and I called up my, my cousin Mike because he's county police, and I thought he could point me in the right direction. And so he pointed me to a place called the Royal Inn in Odenton, and he said, you know, there, there might be some people there that are behind on rent, and, uh, and so maybe you could just call up and, and offer to, to, to pay it for them. I said, man, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That's perfect. So I called up the Royal Inn, and um, the conversation on the phone left me very unsettled because I explained who I was and what I was trying to do, and I, I, I really got a strong sense that I was being dodged, like... Um, like, the, like on the other side of the phone, there was just a nervousness and a dismissiveness, and, and they, they got off the phone as quickly as possible, and I said, all right, well, I guess I'm going to have to drive over there, and so I did. It was after dark at this point, and so I parked, and I walked into the front office, cash in hand, and I said, listen, here's the deal. I just, I'm trying to get rid of this money. Just whoever is, is behind on payments, I, I would just like to pay for them. And they would have no dealings with me. And I don't know if they thought I was an undercover journalist or something like this, but I, I, I wouldn't, I don't use this phrase lightly, but because I've never thought this about any other place. The overarching feeling I had is that that was a spiritually oppressive place. And I mean that. I got this nagging sense that something wrong was going on, like people were being taken advantage of. And so here I was after dark at this place. Uh, I needed to get this assignment in. I figured, I, you know, I don't know what else to do. So I just started walking around this facility. And I saw somebody in an adjacent building on the second balcony, and I caught up with him. He was, he was older than me, probably in his, in his 40s or 50s, real little guy, only about five foot tall. And, uh, and he walked with a really bad limp. And uh, I hate this story. Man, this story bothers me. So I caught up with him, and I, uh, and I said, hey, man, I just want to give you some money. And, uh, and he, he appreciated it, and he was really grateful. And then, uh, man, I, I hope you don't laugh at this because I don't find anything about this funny. Uh, I, um, I didn't want to leave him there. It didn't feel right. And so I, I, I really felt like God wanted me to pray for him instead of just giving him the money. And, uh, and so I asked him if I could. I asked him, I said, can I lay hands on you? And um, when I did that, uh, <clears throat> when I did that, he, he backed away from me, and he got real nervous because he thought I, w I was, uh, was going to hit him. He thought, uh, when I asked him, when I gave him money and asked him if I could lay hands on him, he thought that I was offering him money so that I could physically beat him. And that wounded me. 
And I said, man, that is, um, that's not what I meant. I'm so sorry. That's not what I'm about. I did get the chance to pray with them. And I got back in the car, and, uh, and that, uh, this was years ago now. This is obviously a situation that really stayed with me and really bothered me because as I drove home that night, I got emotional thinking about that man because the overarching impression that he left me with is that must have been a man who lived an impossibly difficult life. That, that is the life of a man who has never known love because he couldn't even recognize a simple act of love when it was staring him in the face. And I thought about that experience. I was thinking about that, that story as I was putting this teaching together, and it dawned on me that the same thing could be said for mankind as a whole. Because we, we are so broken by sin, either our own or the sin of others that has impacted us, we are so stained, we are so marred, we are so poisoned by the presence of sin that we can't even recognize the love of God, much less conjure it out of our own hearts. And the reason I can say that with conviction is because when the love of God came down here in the form of a person, we didn't recognize him. We didn't worship him. We didn't serve him. And we didn't hail him as a king. We murdered him. That's how foreign the love of God is to us. That's how fallen we are in our sin, in our natural state. And with that idea in mind, this is what I want to leave you with. With that idea in mind, it makes perfect sense to me that Romans chapter 5, verse 8, tells us that God actually demonstrated his love for us. We are so broken, we are so incapable of even recognizing what real love looks like that Scripture says God had to demonstrate what real love looks like for us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. I looked up that word demonstrated this week. It's a Greek word that carries with it the connotation of setting up something as evidence in court in order to prove your case. What Romans chapter 5 verse 8 is teaching, and I, and I, I want to make this personal for you because it should be personal for you. What Romans is saying is that the cross is the evidence that God has set up for you to prove to you that he loves you. Now, I've been pastoring for a little over eight years now, which means I've gotten a behind the scenes look in more than a couple different people's lives. And I know enough about people to know that there's people listening to me right now where you've had experiences in your life that God has allowed, God has led you through. There have been things that you've experienced that have left you wondering, does he really love me? Does he really care about me? Do I really matter to him? God knew that we would ask questions like that. God knew that our own hearts would lead us astray like that. And so what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 is saying to you personally is that when you have asked, does he really love me, the cross is the evidence. The cross is God saying, yes, I do. And the cross is the lens through which we are to interpret every single experience that God in his sovereignty allows us to have. And what you and I are called to do is what every responsible person does with evidence that's presented to them. We hold it up and we study it and we analyze it and we examine it from every possible angle because as we do, the one way, unconditional, life-changing love of God becomes real to us. It becomes a love that we experience. It begins to transform us and we grow in the ability to show it to the people that he's placed in our lives. Let me call the worship team up and we're going to close. <clears throat> what this passage of scripture shows us very plainly is first and foremost the essence of what it means to be human is to love. It's what God designed us to do. It's an integral part of our DNA. <clears throat> and the love that God requires of us is a selfless love. A love that we are absolutely powerless to conjure up in and of our own strength. But if you and I will allow the law of God to humble us and the love of God to heal us, in other words, if we will continually rid ourselves of this poisonous idea that we can justify ourselves and allow ourselves to experience the life-changing love of Jesus, 
then what will happen is we will develop and we will grow in the ability to do what God has put each one of us here to do, which is to love. That's it. That's all. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father God, you have called us to a kind of love that, that it is so obvious we don't have the power to simply produce. We are, we are in so desperate need of a source of love from outside of us to change us. And Father, I, I'm just so thankful for the truth of Romans chapter five, verse eight, that that love has been demonstrated to every single one of us. That love has been put on display before the eyes of every single one of us, like evidence produced in a court of law to prove the validity of the case. You welcome us to study the cross, that the evidence of your love for us might sink deeply into our lives and change us, God. And I would just ask that that would happen, that we would be a community marked by that, marked by people who move out into life, holding on to the evidence of your love as demonstrated in the person of work and work of Jesus Christ. In the name of the risen Son of God, we ask these things. Amen. Amen.